Um, I'm gonna have I'm gonna introduce you, Ricky Carew. Um, I was surfing on the web about a about a year ago, actually, and I started I was just lis listening for other people's ideas on real estate and what made them successful in that. And I stumbled across one of his podcasts, so I started following it, implemented a lot of the uh, tools and techniques with sales calls and just what you do with the just numbers to get to be successful and to keep that mindset every day. Uh, Ricky is a agent, single agent with Remax out of Orange Beach, Alabama. Um, his numbers, he's just crushing it up there, 39 million on his own last year just in sales. So um, without further delay, I know a lot of you guys have a lot of stuff going on today, so let's let him uh, get started. Ricky, it's all you. Appreciate it. Good morning, guys. How we doing? Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you guys so much for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here. Um, you guys are, I feel like you guys are going to get a lot out of this. Um, how many, like, is everybody here in real estate? How many, is everybody in real estate? How many newer agents? Wow. My advice for you newer guys is never raise your hand or admit that you're a new agent. <laughs> um, so I'm going to talk for a little while. I'm going to go over a little bit about my story and kind of my mindset philosophy. I'm going to get into some of the details of uh, what I do, um, how I do it, how I create relationships. Um, and then we're going to do some Q&A. So I'm really looking forward to some of you guys' questions that, uh, that you're going to come to me with at the end. Um, just to create a little context, um, a couple of things I want you guys to get out of this today. Um, I want you guys to start really paying attention to and lining up who you are as a person, as a, as a human, as a real estate agent. I want you to line that up with how you're communicating with your prospects and clients. And I want you to value relationships over transactions, right? So I'm gonna give you a little background. I'm 36, uh, I got in real estate when I was 20. Uh, before that, I roofed houses with my dad uh, as a teenager. Uh, he had a roofing business. So when I got in real estate, there was no Facebook, Zillow, Mojo, Red X, none of that mm -hmm. stuff. So. I had to figure it all out, right? There wasn't a lot of tools that you have today. Um, so what I had to do is, I was used to laying shingles and getting paid and roofing a house. And so when I transitioned into real estate, I had to figure out what in real estate related to laying shingles, you know, uh, to roofing. Like what, what can I do in real estate that's the same as laying shingles and roofing? What action? is gonna create the results and produce. And so, uh, you know, through asking and watching and trying to figure everything out, I ran across the mail outs, postcards, letters, and I thought that might be it. So I just started crushing that. Um, I started just sending out massive mailing and I didn't really get much results, you know, now, I continued that, and later on, I did get massive results, and I still do postcards and letters today. Um, but it didn't give me anything right then. I'm looking for something now. I need business. I need money. Um, so I ran across cold calls, right? There was an agent in my office that taught me how to look up owners, how to find their phone numbers, how to look up comps, and I started making phone calls. Uh, and I started to get some, I started to do business. And I said, that's it. That is the equivalent to laying shingles in real estate. So um, I just became a phone call machine. Like I just started just crushing the phones. Um, and I learned really early on that conversation, real conversation, that's the key to all closings. Like there's not a there's not a closing ever that happens without a conversation. Um, it doesn't matter if where you get the lead from, right? If it's online, postcard, sign, where you get 
the lead from, you have to talk to them. And so my, my thoughts were, I'm just going to talk to as many people as I can. And so who, whatever agent talks to the most prospects and has the most conversations wins. It's really that simple. Uh, real estate is really simple, right? The hard part is implementing the simple tasks consistently over time and just continue to grind it out. But it took me, right, I did close to $40 million last year. When I first started in real estate, eight months to make my first sale. And agents come to me all the time now that are two, three, four months in the business and say, I'm not, I haven't sold anything. And I'm like, I don't know what to tell you. You know, it took me eight months to make my first sale, so welcome to the club. But um, in today's world, it, it is, a, you can really get in and, and, and go a lot. You can really start a lot faster. So really new agents haven't made. There's so many things, right? Um, to me, the, the, the most interesting technology for me now is the, is the dialer. Like the dialing systems that will single or double or triple dial people. And you can have all these conversations, right? I love social media. I use social media. Email. Email is, is the foundation of my business. I send a weekly email to my clients every week on the same day forever. I've been doing that since 2007. Um, that is the foundation. That, that, that's the glue that holds all my clients and keeps me relevant with my entire sphere. And they call me when they get ready to do something. Um, and, I, and I love all that stuff. But the dialer to me is where you can actually create business right now. Short and long term. So I make my first sale. I start selling things. I'm selling two a month. I'm getting the hang of it. And then the market explodes. And prices double in a couple years. Um, at that point, you know, I would, this was 2003, four. You know, I'm 22, three. I make a ton of money, a ton, a truckload, and everything's going super well. And I'm thinking I'm on top of the world. I'm retired. Everything is amazing. Um, I've got Hummers and Cadillacs, and then the market crashes, right? And when the market crashes, I absolutely lose everything and some. I was negative. And so here I go. I'm 20. I'm a roofer. I'm 23. I'm a millionaire. I'm 25. I'm bankrupt. And I'm sleeping on friends' couches. And I go back to roofing houses. And I work on an oil rig for a year. And not even looking back, but at the time when this happened, I am literally thinking to myself, this is awesome. Because there were 40 and 50 and even 60 year old guys right next to me that were, that were going through the same stuff as I went through when I'm 25. And I knew that that was a blessing because I was about to learn the greatest lessons of business and life at such an early age where these guys that were right next to me, my partners, are having to learn it at 40, 50, and 60 years old. I read over 100 books. I had such a, I'm such a driven, like I have such a driven personality. I just wanted to know what I did wrong, like where I went wrong, how did I fail. Um, I just had such a, such a why, like I wanted to know why. I read a ton of books. I studied the market. I asked questions. And 2005 was the last time I sold a property. And then 2008 was the next time I sold a property. So between 2005 and 2008, I sold zero. I was roofing houses, working on an oil rig, and like trying to figure out what happened. In 2008, I got laid off from the oil rig. And it, I, I got back into real estate. It was a really, really unique situation. I don't think I ever told anybody this. I bought a million email addresses, and I emailed every single one of them in 2008, and I said, hey, the beaches are half price, is what they were three or four years ago. Who wants some? And out of the million emails, a thousand people responded, and 20 of them bought something that year. And that was my foot back in the door of real estate. Um, so 
it, it was it was very interesting. Uh, as I'm doing this, um, people are responding to me. There's a lot of foreclosures. All these people bought foreclosures. I basically was selling foreclosures to buyers during that time, and a couple things happened. One. The people that were responding, they wanted a weekly report of the foreclosures. You know, I heard, I heard it so many times, you know, will you send me a weekly list of the foreclosures? And so that's where my weekly email developed. I listened to my clients. They told me what they wanted. And so I just started sending everybody this weekly report with foreclosures. So as time went on and the foreclosures went away, it, 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 it morphed into just a report without foreclosures. You know, so since 2007, this thing's went out every single Wednesday, no matter what, and it'll continue to go out forever. That's what holds my business together, right? So I get back in, in 08, I do well. 09, I do a little better. 2010, oil spill, BP oil spill, hit our area really hard. That year, uh, rentals went away. Everybody that was booked, canceled. Nobody's at the beach. Everybody's scared of the oil, the chemicals, and everything else. That was a, that was a down year for us. Um, so I looked at it as an opportunity. I said, I'm going to take everything I learned in the big crash, and I'm going to apply it to this mini crash. And I'm going to see if you know, my, my theories and mindset are correct. You know, am I going to make it through this, this little crash? Which... Who knows? Maybe it could have been a big crash. Maybe the we did have black seas and all that stuff. Nobody knew. That's what that's what's scary part about it. Nobody knew what was going to happen with that. So I make more money in 2010 than I did in 2009. In a down year, I make more money, a lot more money than I did the year before. So how did I do that? Right. Um, well, when I did do it. That gave me the confidence that I needed. Like, I always wanted to be at REMAX. I always wanted to, to be there with the best agents. Um, but I was always scared of the desk fee. I wanted to wait until I had absolute confidence that I could close sales consistently before I did that. So when I made it through the oil spill, I made more money. In a year where transactions went down, agents were getting out of the business, so on and so forth, that's when I made my move. But just to break down like what my philosophy was at the time and how I actually uh, made more money during that time, because I want you guys to know how I feel about this because it's going to happen again. We're going to have a crash. It's going to happen at some point. Who knows when, but who knows how big it's going to be or small. It's going to happen. But what happens in a crash is transactions go down, right, a certain percentage the number of agents that leave the business is a larger percentage than, than the percentage of transactions that goes down. For example, in my market, during the big crash, we went down 50% transactions. We lost about 75% of agents, okay? So what does that do? It creates more transactions per agent for the ones that stay, right? But how do you do business, right? Okay, that's great, but there's more transactions per agent, but how do you actually do business? You do business because you understand that during a crash, a couple of really great opportunities happen. One is that when the market goes down, um, you have to switch your mentality, right? Say you're um, helping homeowners buy primary homes or, or families buy condos or whatever. Well, that, those buyers are going to switch. Those buyers are going to go away. And that's what scares agents. The buyers they're working with in this great market go away. But what you have to do is switch over to the other buyers, the investors. Because when the market goes down, the investors want to buy right now before it goes up. There's urgency. Um, so what you have to do is, is change your game plan. You call, I call property owners and say, hey, the market's crashing, uh, what do you want to do? Do you want to buy because it's down before it goes up? Do you, want, do you need to sell because you're in trouble? <laughs> or are you just going to hold and ride this thing out? Either way it goes, I want to know if you have an agent in place already, and if not, 
I would love to work with you whenever you do decide to do something. What's your email address? And I'm going to capture that forever in my weekly email where now they get to know me through my emails. And now they call me when they get ready. But I'm going to run into people that want to buy right now and that have to sell right now. Does this make sense? Yeah. That's what happens when the market crashes. Opportunity. So I make more money in 2010. <clears throat> I go to Remax. And now I combine this incredible, like all my strategies and philosophies with this really great brand. And that's when I really started to go to the moon. Uh, 2014, I did 100 deals, 1,500 deals, 1,600 deals. Last year, I did 130 deals. I was the number one remix agent in the state of Alabama, which, to be honest with you guys, I don't really care about. What I'm proud about the number one thing is, is everything that I went through to get there. Like losing everything, figuring it out, adapting, all the, all the failures, everything I went through, roofing houses, going back to roofing houses, working on an oil rig for a year. Like those are the things I think about when I think number one. Um, another thing is when I did hit number one, I was like, I'm gonna use this in my marketing. Nobody cares that you're number one. I think I made a post about that. I get less engagement on social media stuff where I'm saying I'm number one than anything else. Because nobody really cares. For one thing, everybody says we're number one. So it almost discredits you that you're saying it. And if you're really number one, you don't have to say it, right? Um, so it, it's, it's an honor to be that, but to me, it really, it, 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 it's not number one in 2017, it's number one in life because it's all about the next level. I want to go to the next level, next level, next level. That's why I'm doing this today. You know, I feel like I got to the top of the mountain of real estate. And so I was discussing it with someone about, he was wondering about how I balance this huge real estate business I have as a single agent and coaching training, speaking. How do I do all that? Well, how I do it is, is when you're building your business and you're trying to get to the top of the mountain, you have the time where you execute. And then there's all this other time where you're trying to figure it out. You're trying to figure out what to do, how to do it, how to get better. You're learning, you're reading, all that stuff. Well, when you get to the top of the mountain, now you don't have to really figure it out anymore. You've got it figured out. So now you have all this time where you were figuring it out open. And so I have to keep all my time filled up with something. So when I got there, I had to fill up this, this time with something else. So that's kind of how I balance it is, it, is it's all relative to where you are in your career. I didn't say anything about selling 100 products. When I, when I hit 100 in 2014, I didn't say it. I didn't post it, I didn't put it anywhere. Um, you know, I didn't say anything about any of my success in real estate until I wanted to try to start helping other agents. And the only reason I would say anything about it is to use it to show credibility that, hey, this is what I did, and this is why I feel like I have something that maybe you can use. So that's my story of real estate. What did I learn? Like what the big takeaway from when the market crashed the first time you know, there was a lot of things, but the, the, the biggest takeaway was that you have to value relationships over transactions. Um, in the beginning of my career, I could literally call 10 condo owners and say, who wants to make 100000 And someone's going to do it. Like, somebody wants to make 100000 a day. And I would list it. It would sell in 24 hours. It would close in 30 days. And we would go our separate ways, me and the client. They didn't want to buy another condo for 100000 more than they just paid for it. And I didn't really care if they wanted to talk to me again. I could call 10 more owners and do the same thing. So there was no substance. There was no relationships. There was no follow-up. There was nothing. So when the market crashed, since I was so deal-oriented at the time, um, I lost it all. I didn't know how to recover because I'm too concerned about the deal. There's, a, there's many, many reasons why relationships 
are to be valued over transactions. Um, but I believe that agents, mainstream training and agents are far more too concerned with how many appointments you got and how many listings you got and how many closings. And really to me, yeah, you need closings, you need listings and all that. You're gonna get that if you're working, right? But what's more interesting to me is how many relationships did you put in place, right? There, there was an agent a, a couple days ago that said, he, I've been teaching him how to do calls and do this, and he said, I've made 9,000 something calls this year, and I've got four listings. And he said, what are those numbers telling you? And I said, nothing. I have no idea what those numbers are telling me at all. What I need to know is, is how many email addresses you've got. How many of those owners, like how many people did you talk to out of the 9,000 calls? And how many of those owners gave you their email address? Trusted you, felt good enough about you, was comfortable enough with you to give you their email address. That's what's interesting to me, and that's where I can tell you where your skill level is, not the listings. Because you can't control if someone's going to list their house, right? Because they make that decision, not you. You're not going to talk anyone in to, to listing a house or selling a house or buying a house. You're not going to talk them into it. They've already decided when they're going to do that, if they're going to do it now, if they're going to wait till their daughter graduates college, if they're going to you know, buy an investment property next year because they're waiting on the stock market for this or that. They've already, whatever their personal decisions are, you're not going to all of a sudden call somebody up and say, and say something slick to get them to move forward, right? Your job, actually, is very simple, to make them feel comfortable with you. That's it. Like, the number one reason why somebody chooses a real estate agent is, is because they like you. Like, likability is number one. And I think whenever you, you're trained to go after the appointment, or the deal, or the closing, or to handle an objection, I think it's sending the wrong message to the prospect of, you're just another realtor that wants to do a deal. And you can find those on every corner, right? But if you if you approach it in a in an angle of how can I help you, not you want to buy or sell, but what can I do to help you today? And you're not trying to actually pressure them into doing anything. You're just trying to get in there to get a conversation going to see if there are is the possibility of a working relationship, right? So I just think that that if you if you really take a look at the, the mainstream training, it, it, it kind of sends the wrong message. So I want to go back to lining up who you are with how you communicate. I'm sure, I'm looking around the room, and I, I'm sure, like, I'm looking in all you guys' eyes, and I'm sure all of you guys are really good people, that you mean well, that you care about your clients, that you really, truly want to help them. But most of us have not been trained to communicate who we actually are. You haven't been trained to actually communicate that, like who you are as someone who genuinely cares. You've been trained to go after the deal, close the deal, right? So if you can communicate who you actually are with someone, number one, it feels natural to you. Like it, like it feels awkward to try to force somebody into something they don't want to do, right? Like that, that's never a good idea. But the thing is, guys, is when you're, when you're talking to people, if you make 100 calls or if you knock on 100 doors or whatever, however you get in front of people, um, the thing is, is they're not going to do what they're not, they don't want to do. You know, that's just the bottom line. But you're talking to them anyway, right? Most agents, when, they're, when they go through their list, they just want to see who wants to do a deal today. That's all they're looking for. Who wants to do a deal today? <laughs> to me, I think maybe less than 1% of people that you talk to the first time you talk to them want to do a deal right then. But based on your personality and if you line up who you are with how you communicate, I believe that maybe 20% of people you talk to actually like you enough to do a deal. They're just not ready yet. Right? So you're talking to them anyway. 
why not establish a relationship with these people, right? And so most agents live off the less than 1% of people that want to do a deal right now, and they disregard everybody else. But if you have this mindset that, wait, if I come to them with, from a place of, you know, helping, and I can actually create comfortability and likability, and 20%, not 1%, but 20% of people like me enough to do a deal, and I can follow up with them every week by email, and they call me when they get ready. That's where all the money's at. That's where all the money is. That's how you get to 100 deals a year. You get there by living off the 20%, and here's the thing. You're talking to them anyway. Why not spend the time you are talking to them and establish a relationship? Right? Does that make sense? So... I guess I want to like go real quick, like through maybe a phone script, um, my phone script. And the thing about the phone script is, is I'm coaching, but everything I do is free, right? So for the past year, I started coaching a year ago, and I've tried everything, and I was charging, and I, I had 200 members that were paying me. A couple weeks ago, I canceled 118 payments, automatic payments that were coming off those 200 people, and I go free, totally free, um, because of a couple reasons. One, I'm losing people. I'll, I'll, I'll spend $1,000 on Facebook, I'll sign up 300 people for a webinar, 100 people will show up to it, and one person signs up. 99 of those agents wanted my help, but because I wanted a couple hundred dollars and have a handout, they said, that was great, I learned a little bit, but I'm gonna go elsewhere, right? I learned stuff, but eh, Ricky, he just wants money, he's another one of those, right? I wanna, I wanna help all hundred people, and I'll get paid on the back end, speeches, books, etc. cetera. So, so I can be 100% genuine to, to people when I'm talking to them, coaching them, because there's no ulterior motive I'm not trying to get anyone to pay me a dime, right? I genuinely want to help you. So I woke up three months ago and I realized that I wasn't running my coaching business the way that I'm coaching real estate agents to run their real estate business. I coach real estate agents, it's about the relationship. But here I am trying to get people to pay me, pay me, pay me. And so it took me some time to realize this and I'm always trying new things and figure out what works and what doesn't work. And this is going to work. The other side of it is, is when I do come to talk to you guys, before, when I'm, paying, when I'm charging people, I have to hold back. I can't tell you everything because I want there to be a reason why you pay me. Right? And one of the things that I hold really close is my phone script. I feel like that's something that people really wanted, and so I wouldn't give it to people unless they paid me. But now, I can, I can give it to anybody that wants it. Right? So I'm really happy about that, and I'm really glad I can share this part with you because it is, it is a little deep. Like, it's more than just what you say. It is how you say it, why you're saying it, and it's about reading the person on the phone. Um, so if I'm calling owners, ring, 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 hello, Mr. Johnson? Yeah, that's Mr. Johnson. Hey. Mr. Johnson, this is Ricky Carruth at Remax of Orange Beach. How are you doing today? My tone, how I'm talking, how I'm relaxed. I want them to feel like they're a friend or a family. Like I'm a friend or a family. And I want to get into that zen in my mind where when I'm calling my dad, that feeling I get of being very calm and comfortable, somebody I've talked to a million times, that's how I want to feel in my stomach. I want to, I want to project that same tone, right? So, hey, this is Ricky Cruz at Remix of Orange Beach. How are you doing today? Good, good. Yeah, me too. I'm enjoying the day. Isn't it gorgeous outside? If you'll notice, there's how are you doing today and there's isn't it gorgeous outside. There's two questions, nothing about real estate. I'm loosening them up, right? And two questions to get two responses so that I can read how their day is going. I'm listening to their tone, how quick, are they busy, are they sad, are they mad, what's going on with them, and then I'm going to adjust my conversation accordingly. Um, and then there's the awkward part of the call, because most people feel awkward about saying something about the weather, but the weather can be anything. It can be 
Christmas, New Year's, Easter, something in the news. It could be anything. It's just something that's not real estate related to, to loosen them up. Then comes the awkward part where it's like, okay, why are you calling, right? This is the transition part where you say, yeah, I got you. Well, look, I don't want to take up too much of your time today, but a house down the road sold, or I just listed something, or something went under contract, and I didn't know if there's anything I could do to help you. I'm not asking them to buy or sell. I'm asking them if there's something I can do to help them. I'm respecting their time, don't want to take up too much of your time, and I'm giving them some, some very recent market information that they probably don't know because it just happened yesterday. There's always fresh market information. Like things are happening on MLS every single day. <clears throat> There's always something that you can beat all the other realtors to. You can, you can be the number one in information providing to your clients. Um, if, you're, if you're new and you just want to be, you know, how do you stand out? How do you beat the experienced guys? Well, the experienced guys are too busy selling stuff. They don't have the time that you have on your, on your hands to actually look at MLS and see what's sold today or under contract. And you can relay that information to every all the market first, right? So when I ask them if there's something I can do to help them, if they say yes, it's like, okay, cool. Do you have an agent you're working with on that? And then I'll follow through with wherever that goes. If they do have an agent, then nothing really, nothing really you can do. They have an agent. Their mom's an agent. Their brother's an agent. Their best friend from high school is an agent. You're not going to win that deal. Move on, right? So, but if they, if they say no, there's nothing you can do for me, that's, that's what I'm looking for because that's the opportunity to find out, I got you, well look, is there an agent you would work with if you were to do something? So now I'm pre-qualifying them if they already have a relationship in place um, or not. See, the one problem I see with, with agents is when they make calls and they don't really understand this, They'll have great conversations with people and they'll think, I have a prospect, I have a new client, this is awesome, I'm really in, you know, but they don't know that their mom's a realtor and they're never, no matter how much they like them, they'll never use them. So this phone script does a lot and it pre-qualifies a lot and it sets you up for long term to win. Uh, no, there's not an agent. Okay, cool, well look, I'm sure at some point you're going to want to buy or sell something. I would love the opportunity to work with you when that day comes. Would it be all right if I stayed in touch with you? Sure. Cool. What's your email address? And see how I set it up where I ask them if it's okay if I stayed in touch before I ask for the email address because nine times out of ten when they say yeah, they're going to give you the email address. But a lot of agents mess up because they just say, after they say no, they're like, okay, cool, can I stay in touch with your email? And they're like, no, you can't have my email. But if you word it in a way of, hey, I'd like to stay in touch with you. Is it okay if I stay in touch? Yes. And then ask for the email. You're a lot more likely to get it. But it has a lot to do with your tone, right? Because remember, if they sense that you're going after the deal, then they're going to be skittish because they feel like you're just another agent trying to put a deal together, trying to get, get you, you know. But if it comes from a place of sincerity and your tone is right, and that only comes from making calls, and getting better. Like you're not going to get it the first time you make calls. Um, a lot of people want to be perfect at calls before they make any calls, but it doesn't work that way. You have to make a lot of calls to get perfect. Um, I'm pretty good, but I'm still working on it too. Uh, so that's my script. Um, you guys can actually get it on my website, zerodiamond.com. Um, and you, there's videos of me making calls, the whole deal. Um, and you can kind of figure out what I do there. Um, let's see. That's basically it, guys. Um, I want you to I want you to really think about what I said about long longevity, weekly email, uh, relationships over transactions. Um, but I, I guess like, a, a, you know, we're going to do some Q&A, so I'd love to hear whatever questions you have. But something I feel really strongly about is that you have to build your business on the phone, and then you build your brand with everything else. 
I think too many people are trying to build their business. Now, if I were new, I, I really would try to build my business on Facebook, right? But since I already had, I didn't even do social media until last year. I had a Facebook account, I had a YouTube channel, but I didn't do anything with it until January 2017 at all. And so it went from zero to a million, but I already had a really, really huge business uh, before I even really touched or even thought about social media. I used it at zero because I was kind of stuck in my ways and it was working. So it's like, if it isn't broke, don't fix it. So I just continued to do what I, what I knew. And real estate is unique because there has to be that voice to voice contact. That's why I believe technology hasn't replaced real estate agents because there has to be the voice to voice contact and the relationship. So I felt like, and I still feel like, I, I still to this day feel like I could squash social media and everything and I could sit with a dialer or even just a phone and a way to find owner's phone numbers and do a weekly email and get right back where, where I am now. Email is technology. I mean, you know, like, it may be old school technology, but, but people read their emails and it is a way to stay relevant. And if that email comes through on the same day, every single week forever, see guys, when, when I call, and I established the relationship, I get the email, they felt good, they thought we had a good conversation. Then they start getting this weekly email from me. The email does all the heavy lifting for me. When it comes every single week on the same day forever, it shows them how consistent I am, and professional, and hardworking, and knowledgeable, right? It, it, it embodies everything that I am, like my personality goes through the email because I design it every week. I take an hour to design it every single week. It's not automated. I sit down, I come up with what it's going to say, and, and I physically do it. Not my assistant, me. Because that is, that's the portal between me and all my clients. And it has to be the way I think it needs to be. And so, but it does all the heavy lifting for me. Like, it stays in front of them. It builds the relationships. They call me when they get ready. That's the kind of business you want is when people call you, when they're ready to do something. And there's no competition. When people call me, they've been getting my email for five years, they're, they're not going to call any other agents. They're only going to deal with me. And so it creates loyalty as well as, uh, you know, build strong relationships. So um, I think that that's what you guys, uh, you know, should really kind of think about uh, and it doesn't have to be a weekly email but you have to have to stay in front of people on a consistent basis to stay relative and just make sure that you're not trying to pressure anybody into doing anything but be there when they when they get ready make sense makes sense thank you guys that you're putting together, where are you getting the information and what type of information you're sending out? Um, I have a Facebook group, Zero to Diamond Real Estate Agents, and I post my email on there every Wednesday for all those agents to just see it. Um, but it's new listings, closed sales, a featured property, maybe an article about the area. It always has a big picture of, of something in my area, uh, different links, um, you'll just have to look at it. It just has basic market information. Most of the links go to my website. Some of them go to MLS. Um, it just depends on what I came up with that week, you know. And what, what, what has been tough for me in the past is how do I come up with content in this weekly email that, that keeps people interested in opening it up every week? But what I, what I realized over doing this for 11 years is that People just want to see what's sold. They want to see the new listings. They want to see what you think is a featured property. They, they really, because like I said, closings are happening every day, stuff's going under contract, and so there's always fresh information. And if they're getting that every week and it's showing that fresh information every week, that's really what they want. That's really what's going to keep them 
coming back. I have a lot of people that doesn't open the email. But then two years later, now they're kind of interested. Now they're opening it. And so, you know, my, my list is over 10,000 people. 3,000 of those people open it up every week. So I got, so got 7,000 people that get it that don't open it up. But I'll have clients that call me and tell me, hey, I, uh, they act like I'm going to get mad that they don't open up my email. I'm like, I haven't really been reading it, but, you know, I'm calling you now and I want to do this or that. And I'm like, okay, cool. I don't care if you open it up or not. Do you use some kind of contact manager to do that? Or you say you, you personally sit down and do it yourself? Constant contacts. Constant contacts. Yeah, I've used them since 2010. It's a really funny story because when I first started doing, when I did the million emails in 2008, I did it all through Yahoo, right? And so you can only do, I think, 100 per email in Yahoo. So I was using Outlook so I could time them. So it set up like 100 of them to like go out like one every five minutes or so for like 24 hours or something. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so that, and I didn't even have a website. That should be a statement to you guys that all that matters is that you're actually talking to people and, and creating relationships and stuff because I didn't even have a website when I started doing this. People are way too concerned with like what my business card looks like and what my website looks like and doing the details of their postcard and all this stuff. It doesn't matter at all. Just watching your presentation today, you have a great video presence, but when you use the telephone, you lose that video presence. And I was going to ask, have you considered having a video as far as responses to emails and things like that? Uh, the NAR convention a couple of years ago, people were saying how much more successful that is. And also, you can time it. You can do it and send it to them. They can open it and see your response. And it just solidifies one of your best features is your communication. Yeah. By not doing that, you're, yeah. I, I feel you're probably. So you're right. saying that send them videos of you speaking, you mean, about well, the market? Well, it's not so much. Uh, or personal well, you, emails like yeah. bomb bomb and stuff? Well, you could do the podcast, you know, say a, possibly a short five minute or 10 minute podcast for your weekly thing, and then yeah. have all the detail yeah. associated. But that would make it much more, and it remind them of, oh, look, Ricky's gotten gray, or Ricky's doing this, or whatever. Yeah. <laughs> and anyway, it's, it's a great thing to, <clears throat> to embrace people more. So you're saying in my weekly email that I should do more video? Uh, or have more audio or video? Yeah, no, I, I think it's a composite thing. You have to think if you want to be face-to-face -face yeah. on it. Um, I'm a, well, I'm not a licensed mortgage broker, but I'm not practicing, but there's just these guys in California, every day they have like a show, a podcast. Yeah. And um, I think it's a great idea. And right? I think you so, of all people. So you guys, you know, good idea, you know, go, go execute. Here's the thing, guys, I get you. Everything works. Everything, like for cell owners, door knocking, internet leads, all of it works, right? Video and the email, let's mix that, let's mix this. Who cares, right? Just do it. Just just go do it and create results, right? Create relationships and do it. Um, you know, Constant Contact does not have the ability to embed a video. I can link videos. I can link videos to YouTube and I can do, you know, it's not like bomb bomb, bomb bomb embeds a video in the email. You can watch it right there on the email. You know, um, I, I just started doing social media a year ago. I, I, I'm one of those, like, I'm actually kind of a really, I, I really like the position I'm in because I've had to build my business the old school way, right? Completely old school. And now, but I'm young enough to understand technology and, and now I'm, I'm, I'm all in. And so I've got the best of both worlds. I'm not just tech, right? And I'm not just making phone calls. Right now, now I'm a combination of both sides and really killing it on, on, from both ends. I can't do everything. Do I want to try doing the? I've, I've been thinking about doing like videos on Facebook, linking it through my email, and doing all kinds of stuff. I'll get to it, you know. Um, but uh, you know, very good point. Try it, guys. What's up, Mr. Ricky? Uh, thank you for everything. Got a question for you. As a part-time agent now and wanting to transition into full-time, 
what would be your suggestions to make that happen ASAP? You know, and then once I do that, what would you recommend to really, really crush it right off the bat? Well, uh, I mean, going from part-time to full-time, my general advice is always replace your income with real estate until you, you know, before you make the move. Because I don't know if you have a family that you have to support, right? Yeah, so you can't just go cold turkey and just risk <laughs> everything on real estate when you're not making any money in real estate. So you have to replace your income with your day job with real estate before you make the switch. So what, what hours do you work your day job? Uh, work pretty much nine to six every day, uh, sometimes eight to six, what have you. Um, so, so, so here's the thing. I sell real estate for a living, right? But I'm a part-time speaker, right? So how do I do that? I sell real estate all day, and then I work on my speaking stuff all night, right? And so for you, what I would do is you get off at six. Yes, sir. I, I, this is what I would do. I would have all my phone numbers ready and I would start calling them on my drive home from work. Okay. I would literally call people in my car on my way home because you don't want to wait too late. You, know, you can't call them at seven once you get home. You know, six is getting kind of late already. But you need to make like five calls at least or five or ten calls on your way home, right? Um, have them in your phone ready where you don't have to dial the numbers. Go ahead and dial them and hit send and then end. And that way when you get in there, you can just hit send. Okay, do talk to them, send. You know, that way you're not getting in a wreck. But, <laughs> but, but I mean, being efficient though, right? Like winners don't, winners make it happen. They just make it happen. Like there's no uh, secret or there's no like equation. Like they just make it happen. Um, a lot of stuff, like the speaking stuff for me, has been a lot of work for nothing up to this point, right? Um, same thing with real estate. You have to risk your time for the fact that you really want this, you really want to help people, and that you're going to make it happen. And so you just got to tell yourself that I'm going to make this happen, period, right? Like, that I believe that there's four keys to long-term success. The first key is you got to believe. Right? If you don't believe, you're dead right there. And when I say believe, 100% fully committed, no other options. And so in your mind, you're already the number one agent. That's the way you should be thinking. I'm, I'm, I am the number one agent, right? Even though you're not there yet, you are in your mind. Like me, I'm the number one real estate speaker in the world already, right? I know that, right? The second part is work hard. So I don't know you. But believe, work hard, adapt, and be patient. See, the people that believe, they're everywhere. People that believe and work hard, not very many. People that believe, work hard, and adapt, very few. People that believe, work hard, adapt, and are patient. <laughs> the patience part was my biggest straw because I always believe, work hard, and adapted. But the patience part was the part that I had trouble with. I. Uh, in 2014, I did 600K. I wanted to do a million the next year. I did this huge plan. I'm gonna do this, 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 and this, and I'm gonna get there. The next year, January rolls around. I'm trying to put the pieces in place, February, March, and I'm looking at my income, and I'm saying, I'm gonna make the same amount of money this year as I made last year, and I start really getting down on myself. Really down on myself, and, and that's really a bad place to be. So I started searching again. I want to know what I'm doing wrong. You know, why, what's wrong with me? Why can't I do this? And so I got a coach. Long story short, I realized that I'm doing great. You know, 600K is awesome. But the thing from 600 to a million is, is patience. Like I'm doing all I can do. Guys, to reach your full potential is, I refer to it like a cup, right? Everybody has a different size cup. Your cup represents how much you can handle. How much business can you handle? Because some agents have a couple things under contract, it blows their whole day. And I don't get that. I've never understood how two listings and one pending takes up 40 hours in a week. So to me, like I, I keep 20, 15 to 20 properties under contract, 50 to 60 listings at all times. That's, that's kind of my cup. I can handle maybe a little more, but 
But what you have to do is overwhelm yourself with business, make 2,000 calls or you know whatever you do to get business. See, people are scared to overwhelm because they don't want to reduce their customer service, right? They're scared they're gonna they're gonna give up some of their customer service, but things that scare you, you probably need to do, right? So overwhelm yourself, find out where your breaking point is. How much can you handle, right? And then once you know that, until you overwhelm yourself, you don't know how much you can handle. So you have to take that leap, overwhelm yourself, figure out how much you can handle, and then stay there. That's how you reach your full potential, keeping as much as you can handle at all times. So, and it's author, right? Yes, yes, sir. Um, I just think that making it happen with no excuses is the big punchline for you, but making calls in your way home could be really big and um, put everything you got into it from that six o'clock to eight o'clock or if you spend time with your family, you make calls, you get home, you spend that time with your family, you put them to bed, now you have an hour to develop the email write some letters, do some postcards, strategize, study the market, see what the new listings were that came up to these, see, see what's under contract, target the neighborhood that you want to go after, right? Plot, right? Closings are happening every day, every single day. So it's not the market, right? They're happening. It's, it's you. You haven't figured out how to make it happen, right? And it's all about relationships. What was your, uh, you say four keys to success? I got believe in yourself, work hard, adapt, patience. Is it two more or is that the four? No, that's four. Okay. <laughs> work hard, adapt, patience. Yeah. Two, three, and four. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Believe, work hard, adapt. Most of you guys, I, I can talk to anyone in here for five minutes that is not successful or not as successful as they want to be. I can have a five minute conversation with you and tell you which of these four things you're lacking in. Because it boils down to these four things, period. And most of you, it's the adapting part. It's the patience, of course, but you don't get to patience until you learn how to adapt. That's after adapt. Most of you get here, here, but the adapting part is the part that most people stumble. How hard was it for you to adapt? I've always been an adapter. I adapt immediately to everything. I could come in this market right here and crush all of you guys. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. But, here's the thing, too. Here's the thing. The agents, you know, I have a thousand or two thousand agents who follow me and all this stuff and ask me questions and and something I get the most the most question I get is about voicemails, you know which is silly, because it's just like, tell them who you are and what you're calling about and call you back. Um, use voicemails as a branding tool. Don't think of it as, I gotta figure out how to say something special to make them call me back. Don't worry about them calling you back. Just use it as a branding tool where you know they heard your name and number and everything. But uh, another, another big one is open houses. Open houses aren't big in my market at all, for whatever reason, but it's, and they're like, oh, you don't do open houses, you know? They're like thinking, what, what is it? You're not even a realtor. Well, if I were in a market where I'm losing listings because I'm not doing open houses, I'll now be the open house king. If, if I'm in a market where horse farms take two years to sell um, and you gotta spend $3,000 to market it, I'm gonna be the horse marketing uh, pricing king. I'm gonna price it just right if I'm gonna spend $3,000 to market that property. I would, you know, adapting is just in my blood. To answer your question. <laughs> Me? Uh, yeah. Uh, your background, you didn't really share everything, but as far as, have you ever been uh, like a, you're a broker associate, but you've not had any agents working with you or for you? Or? I've, tried, I've, I've tried to do a team one time. <laughs> <laughs> I think y'all know the rest of the story. <laughs> and another question, it, it, your Remax experience, obviously you have the great franchise and the tools and so forth, but before that you operated without the, the big franchise. Yeah. Could you sort of show, tell your thoughts about the pros and the cons and what advantages? You Nothing. Have? Nothing. 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 It doesn't matter where you work, it just matters how hard you work. Okay. Right? And so, like, with a small company, you're gonna eventually plateau. 
and you're just going to feel that pressure on your shoulders, like I got to go somewhere else to learn something new or to have more exposure or so forth, and that's when you move to the big brand. But until then, it doesn't matter. If you're building your business, who cares mm -hmm. where you're at? It doesn't matter. You have to learn. You have to learn how to make people feel comfortable with you. That's it. That's it. Tone, body language, um, you know, what you're about, who you really are as a person. That's what matters, not the company. Yeah. They're going to like you for you, not because of where you work. Or how much. They don't care how much you sold, if they like you. But if you come to them kind of nervous, how much have you sold? <laughs> That's when you get that question. When they're trying to evaluate who you are, because it sounds like you just want to do a deal, right? So people think, oh, how can I break into the market? I haven't sold anything. Well, if you're doing your, if you're doing your job of making people feel comfortable with you, you don't have to worry about that. It's not an issue. Hey, I'm Tina Turner from Daytona Beach. I'm visiting. Hey, Thank, you for, Thank you all for having me. But um, Ricky, on your telephone calls in that pre-qualification stage, when you said, um, you know, I asked them if, um, you know, if they have a relationship with a, another realtor. Yeah. Um, do you, if they say yes, my mother's in it, or yeah. yes, uh, you know, the girl that sold me the house, she did a pretty good job. Do you end the conversation right there, or do you probe them a little further to see if it's a current Just depends on the conversation, but I normally end it right there, because they've already said they're not interested in doing anything right now. Now they're saying that they got an agent, whether they're lying or not. It's like, well, they're telling you there's two negatives there. They don't want to do anything, and they got an agent. It sounds like they just want to get off the phone. So what can you do there? You can't really do much. So what I normally say is when they say they have an agent, I'll say, hey, well, who is it? Oh, I know that agent. You're in really good hands. Look, if there's ever anything I can do for you, let me know. Have a good day, and I'll move on. And maybe, so people change agents all the time. So maybe they see your sign, and they see this, and they see that, and then their agent didn't call them back that one time, it really made them mad, and they say, I'm gonna call Ricky. <coughs> so, yes ma'am. Question, you have a brand new agent, first day in the business, they sit down in front of you. What's the first thing you tell them to do and what goal settings do you have them make? I tell them to make calls, call property owners, create relationships, start sending weekly emails. Are you talking about for sale by owners or just no, property owners? No, property, just property owners. owners. Property owners. Yeah. For sale by owners and expires, like I'm not against them at all, right? I am. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm not. I, I don't call them. I don't think it's the most efficient way, right? Um, but, you know, um, it's a high pressure situation. For sale by owners and expires, it's a high pressure. Two other agents are calling them. It's high pressure. If you're calling random owners, very low pressure. They're open. They want to talk. They want to know what's up with the market. They want to get to know you. But when you call for sale owner, they're like, are you another realtor? You know? So it's two different ball games. A lot of people really succeed with for sale owners and expires. I know a lot of them. Um, not my game. I feel like I crush those guys because I'm long game and I want I want width. I want quantity of clients who love me, right? Because I didn't try to pressure them. So they love me now. Right, and now when they decide, they're going to come to me. So, I think the biggest thing for new agents is learning a couple things. One is that losing deals is the greatest thing that can ever happen to you. Right? Too many agents take a loss and get down on themselves because they were looking at what the closing was going to do to their bank account. And then they lose the deal and they think they lost the money, but really they never had the money. <laughs> so what a loss actually does, you, a, a, a seller decides to use a different agent. A buyer <coughs> backed out of a contract cold feet, no reason. Uh, whatever the case may be, what happens is, is very incredible. The, the, the biggest thing is, well, not the biggest thing, but you learn something, right? That's the cliche part of losing deals, but let me tell you the biggest part of it that people don't even realize. What's more valuable than money? Time. You can replace your money if you lose it all tomorrow, but you can't get yesterday back. You can't replace time. It's more valuable. It's your most valuable asset. When you lose a deal, now you get future time back that you don't have to spend on that deal anymore. 
this is where people really, they, I lose them a little bit. The future time that you get back, that you don't have to deal with signing that listing, meeting them, taking the pictures, putting the sign up, putting the lockbox, dealing with the agents want to show it, negotiating the deal, going to the closing, inspection, financing. You don't have to do all that anymore on that situation. You get all those hours, hours back. And now you can take that new knowledge you got from what you, whatever you learned, why you lost the deal. Now you're a better agent because you learned something, but you got hours of your life back where you can take that new knowledge and go get five more deals in the same amount of time, right? If you realize that everything, everything in real estate is a win-win, like there's no way to lose, that's when you really start to understand if I can get that inside new agent's head, then I, I, I think I could really have a shot at helping them succeed because they can just power through, okay, I'm doing deals, uh, lost that one, cool, okay, did, did, um, I got that one, okay, lost that one, you know, and just keep moving forward, and you get, and you understand, and you take advantage of the future time you got back instead of moping. You can always notice a, a losing agent, always talking about the deal that got away, the inspection that went bad, the financing that fell through. That's what they're talking about in the office. When I hear that, I'm like, oh, Lordy, they're not going to make it, right? <laughs> so, concentrate on the deals that are working. Forget about the ones that fell fell apart and use that future time. It's the most valuable thing in the world and you just got some of it back. Um, okay, so I'm along the same lines. For, for newer agents or people who are trying to implement their goals and everything, is there a sort of self-help type thing where, where you, you're taking care of yourself in those moments of weakness, those overwhelming moments and those sort of moments just, where you like Just go there. to my YouTube and just every time you feel bad, just... <laughs> go to YouTube, <laughs> Seriously though, um, I see what you're saying and um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's all about being around people that are minded like me. Like if you can find someone to be around like me, like, follow me on Instagram and YouTube whenever you feel bad. Literally, I go there. Because all the stuff that I'm saying is right there. And, like, you can look and be like, oh, oh, oh. You know, yeah, I'm good, I'm good. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. All right, so if, for agents that are, like, new to an area or just new agents, period, where do you think the majority of time should be spent? Phone as calls. As far as phone calls? Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, where do you she said, as a new agent, where, where should your time be most spent? Or even just like new to the area. What was the answer? Study your market. Okay, if you're, if you're new to the area, all right? If you're new to the area, you don't know what's going on, what you need to do is study MLS for about a half a day. Figure out what's going on in the market. Like, pull up all the sales from the last year and figure out which price ranges are selling the best and all this stuff, right? And then target a subdivision. Say, this one's selling pretty good. It's three, 400 range. It's selling pretty good. There's 100 houses there. I want to I wanna start here. Then you're going to go to all the listings, call all the listing agents, and go look at all the houses. Drive through there. Talk to as many people as you see. Really become familiar with the layout uh, and the geography and, and everything of that subdivision. Then we're going to go to Red X. We're going to get all the numbers. We're going to start calling the owners. We're going to have all the comps in front of us, and we're going to go to town. Start developing the relationships, get the emails, send weekly emails for you. Uh, so you, you talk a lot about building new relationships and doing sure. as much as possible in the volume yes. of building a new relationship. Yes. So when you have 10,000 relationships, yes. how do you still have hair on your head? If they get a weekly email from me, so I don't have to do anything. They but, call me when they get ready to do something. So when you have a lot of those interpersonal relationships working when they all start hitting you, how do you, do you have any advice, I should say, for agents that find themselves with a large volume of good quality. I think it's a good problem to have. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, please, please give me, you know, 100 people call me at once. I'll, I'll, I'll be glad to, to sit down and make a list of all those people and start calling them one by one. It may take me three days to call them all back, but I, I welcome that scenario, you know? And like I told author, winners just make it happen. Doesn't matter, right? Just do it. Like, whenever I had my coach, I was trying to get to a million, 
because I, I hired the coach because I wanted him to show me how to make a million dollars because I was I was going to make six hundred again. Um, and so he, he set up this plan for me. You need, it's kind of similar to the one I had before I called it. You need to make this many calls. You need to do this much. You need to do that much, right? I'm like, okay, cool, cool, cool. So I, I set it up. I'm going to go Monday. I'm going to make this many calls. Today. I'm going to make this many calls. Stuff got in the way, right? Because I am making 600000 I do have a lot of deals going on. So I'm working on my deals. I can't get to the calls. So when I had my coaching call, I said I couldn't make all the I couldn't do the calls. I know I'm too busy. I'm like, what do I do? How do I how do I do this? How do I manage the stuff that just comes up with deals that I have to do versus time blocking to make the calls I need to make to hit my goals? What how tell me, magical coach? And he said he said what all that other stuff? I said I said yeah. What he said just do it, as in. Just do the stuff that you have to do because you have to do that stuff, right? So when 100 people call you at once, you sit down, you make a list of all the people that called you, you start calling back and say, how can I help you, you know? Um, it does get hectic at times. Like you will find yourself in some very, you know, tight situations. Like last Wednesday, my, my report goes out every Wednesday. Last Wednesday was a little while because I had all kinds of appointments pop up. And so... You know, I was like, it was really getting down. It was like four o'clock and I still had like a lot of people had to call back and deals I'm negotiating. And I'm like, ah, but I made it happen. And it went out at like 515 or something, right? So they answer your question, you just make it happen. I mean, it's that simple. I mean, this stuff is really more simple than you think. Yep. How many admin people do you have? One. One. Yeah. She's an absolute animal. <laughs> She's a beast. So, uh, yes, sir. I'll... Just to follow up on this young man's question. Yes, sir. When you say, how can I help you today and what can I do for you? Yes, sir. It comes across as really being genuine and authentic and yes, sir. out the box. So, how do you really handle? If someone's like, okay, well, I need my garage clean, something off the wall or something non-related to uh, real estate, yeah. you know, because I think I would have a problem with people, I'm a pretty nice fella, you yeah. know, taking advantage of my time. And yeah. I know you say time is the most important thing. So yeah. how do we, as professionals, draw the line, so to speak, yeah. with that? I think establish yourself as the real estate agent, not the contractor, right? I think that that's a big like part of it is people know you're a real estate agent and not a contractor and so they draw a line a little bit and sand their self about that but I do get uh, people to ask the ask me stuff kind of off the wall I have contractors that you know I'll say oh, I'll call so-and-so and I'll just refer it to somebody you know if it's a garage guy or uh, a uh, they want their house clean they need something painted they need floor redone or whatever I have people in place, I've got contractors that will do that kind of stuff and I'll just pass their number along. Okay. Now I'm out of it. The problem with it is, is if you refer them to somebody who does a really bad job mm -hmm. and now it's kind of like it's back on you. Mm -hmm. So if I don't have anybody, I'll literally tell them, hey, I don't have anybody for that. I'm sorry. I can't help you with that. So there have been moments like there was, there have been plenty of windows of time where I didn't have a contractor that I felt good about. And so if there was somebody that needed flooring or something done, I couldn't refer them to anybody. And I would just tell them, hey, I, I don't have anybody. And it, here's the thing. When you're honest, they appreciate that. Like the fact that you didn't give them somebody, right, doesn't really matter if you're not giving them somebody because, hey, I don't, I don't feel good about anybody. I wouldn't feel good about giving you anybody. So, and they're like, okay, yeah, please don't give me anybody if you don't feel good about them. See what I'm saying? But... On the flip side, when I do feel good about somebody, I say, listen, I don't refer people unless I feel super good that they're going to take care of you the way that I would take care of you if I were in that business. So I'm going to refer this person to you. So you just say no when you got to say no, and you never put your reputation on the line as much as you can. Even if you refer somebody you feel good about and they do a bad job, you felt good about them, but they did a bad job, that's not a good situation to be in. So you got to be careful, right? Yes, ma'am. Where do you get the numbers and what is the best time of the day to make the call? Red X, theredx.com. If you call them and tell them I sent you, they'll waive the $150 startup fee and get geo leads. 
And GeoLeads, you put an address in the bar, and then it'll find up to 300 addresses, I mean, phone numbers of the owners around that address. It'll find 25, 50, 100, 200, 300, or I don't know, the different tiers. But it's $50 a month, and it finds them in a split second. You put a, you put a, you put a, a address in, and it finds 300 <coughs> owners, numbers, around that address. You just click a button, and boom, they're right there. Can you repeat that? TheRedX.com. Who said that? Yeah, TheRedX.com. And if you call them and tell them I sent you, they'll waive the $150 startup fee. And then you can just start paying $50 a month and get G All you need is Geo Leads. They have a dialer. You can use their dialer if you want, or you can use Mojo's dialer. Or you can call them from your cell phone. Jalen? Hmm? You said Geo, G E O? Geo, yeah, 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 G E O. Yeah, Geo, like geographical. Like Geo Leads. It's Geo Leads. Yeah, it, it, it is awesome because a lot of the numbers, not a lot, some of them are cell phone numbers. The quality of the numbers that it finds is the best, and I've used everything. The only thing I haven't really used is coal resources, if anybody's ever tried that. But uh, I don't know how good their quality is, but I've tried a lot of them, and this one is really, really good. Yeah. And they've already screwed up against the Do Not Call list? They, they, they make a note next to it, mm -hmm. DNC. So some of them say DNC next to it, and that's Do Not Call. So. If you're against doing that, I don't really care. <laughs> is it for, so is it, as far as the do not call list, do they already scrub it for Yeah, you? they scrub it. They have it labeled there next to it. <coughs> so it's um, for the... Okay. They don't, I mean, they don't yeah, scrub it. Like, it's still there. You can still call it, yeah. but it's just labeled DNC. Yes, ma'am. What would be your rebuttal to They already have an agent that they might work with that is willing to do it for 1%. 1%? Yes. I would tell them good luck. These are agents that um, are about the quantity, not the quality. Is this a, is this a, like a Redfin or a, one of those tech technology based? No, actually it's not. Um, yeah. Just some agents I know in the market here because the market Well, here's the thing on discount brokers. Let them go use them. And find out how horrible the service is. So is that what you would say to them? Yeah. <laughs> Go use them, find out how horrible the service is, and then I'll see you in a month. <laughs> right? Here's the thing too. Like like the discount brokers, um, like like okay, they're gonna sell their house through the discount broker, right? But then they're gonna buy a house. Right? So if you do your job. And don't make it a big thing and get mad at them for using somebody else. Maybe you still get the sale when they buy. So it doesn't matter because you're not trying to do the deal. You're trying to help them. And if they feel like that's what's best for them, I want them to go there. And you go do that. Now I have extra time on my hands because you went there. I'm going to go spend my time on these people that pay me 3%, right? And I'm going to help you when you buy something because you love me because I didn't get mad at you because you went to a discount broker, right? <laughs> That's how you handle it. But the, at the, the bottom line, they're going to come back to you. Most of them that use discount brokers find out the service is not where it needs to be. And it's definitely not what I'm going to give them. And so they find out I'm worth my money. Some of them don't care about the service. They'd rather sacrifice money for service. And for those guys, that's fine too. There's unlimited deals for everybody. Like it's unlimited as much as you can handle your cup. Like there's you, your cup's always full. Who cares if something spills over? Yeah. How do you handle overpriced listings? Overpriced listings? Yeah. I try to set the expectation with the seller. Hey, it's not going to be shown at all probably. It's not going to sell. Um, you need to be here. I try to get them down or at least get them down as low as I can and just make them understand that this is going to be tough, probably not going to happen, And then, but I, then I do list it if they want to, even though they, if they understand that and they're good with it and they still want to list it, I want to list it because I, again, don't care about the deal. I want to do what's best for them. And so what happens is it's a very cool thing. Listings I think will never sell, sell in a day. And listings I think will, ne or will sell in a day, never sell, right? So like I, I listed one for 550 a month or two ago, last sales 485 and I tell the seller, I'm like, never gonna happen. It's just, you're just crazy, right? But I sold her the condo for like 460 two years ago, and she's like, "This is just what I'm like." Okay, cool, let's do it or whatever. Sold her for 5:30, closing on it in a couple weeks. Something that I thought would never sell. So here's the thing: you're not the real estate god of pricing, 
right? Buyers are. You know what I'm saying? Like, you don't set the prices. Just because you, you know, what makes you the god of pricing? Like, what, you, you, you look at the comps and now, oh, that's what it is because Ricky said so. No. Actually, the person that's going to buy it will set that price, and you don't know what that price is. And so, what happens is a really cool thing. You overprice it, then the market catches up a little, and the seller reduces a little. Now we're, now we're close in three months, or a year, or two years. I have listings for two years that sell. Because I over because I overpriced it, but I stayed in touch with the seller because I was I, I didn't care about it not not being shown. I cared about maintaining that relationship, so they just let me keep the listing. It sells in two years, right? So concentrate on the relationship, not the deal. You, you speak a lot to listings and prospecting on listings and relationship yeah. listings. Do you work with a lot of buyers? Tons of buyers, 50-50 this year okay. so far. Buyers. My buyers come from property owners. That's my source of buyers. Zero buyer leads. Zero whatever buyer lead they I don't do any of that. I concentrate on the property owners for my buyers and my sellers. It's the most efficient way to work, right? They're dual. They can buy or sell or both. And they're unlimited. You can't call them all in your area. I mean, this is this is like the biggest county in this side of the equator. Like, you'll never call every single one of them, so it's unlimited. So you have an unlimited amount of prospects that buy and sell. Why would you even talk to a buyer lead, right? Unless they're a seller too, right? But there's people that crush with buyer leads, and I, and I love them for it, right? Um, but I feel like the most efficient way to do it is to build long-term relationships with property owners who buy and sell. So like I say, my ratio this year is 50-50. Is there a reason why you send your emails out on Wednesdays? No, you can send them out any day of the week you want. <laughs> Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, it doesn't matter. What matters is that whatever day you pick, you stay with that forever. That's all that matters. If they want to see consistency. How are you going to stand out in the market? Because they got that email from you for five years every single Tuesday, every single Thursday. That's how you're going to stand out. And that's why they're going to pick you, because of that. Yes, Do you need anything different to break into the higher uh, priced market? Yeah, just start calling higher priced property owners. <laughs> <laughs> Did you say anything different to them? No, ma'am. Okay. I wouldn't say anything different to them. I wouldn't say anything different to an expired, a for sale by owner, a buyer lead, or any of them. I would say, hey, this is Ricky Crew, three XR Beach. How are you doing today? Yeah, I'm enjoying the weather. Is it gorgeous outside? Hey, yeah. Well, look, I don't take too much time today, but I saw you looking at something online. I saw your house expired. Uh, I see you have this property. Is there anything I can do to help you? It's the same exact script. That's why I love my script because it's interchangeable with really not only all the different avenues of real estate, but really business in general. You really use it for anything. It's building relationships and it's not going for the kill. You know, it's loosening them up, reading them, what's going on with them today, and then respecting their time, giving them market info, and find out what you can do to help them. Same thing. Yes, sir. Uh, two questions. One, how do I get that five minute conversation with you? And What's that? Have that five minute conversation with you. Uh -huh. And uh, how do we get into your coaching? Zero to diamond.com. You just go there, it's free. You just sign up. 100%. Have a five minute conversation? You can call me anytime. All right. All, my business cards are on the table back there. You guys can grab one and call me anytime. Email me, text me, whatever. Me. Anything else, guys? Yes, sir? Your farm area, is it just the county that you're in? or is it like Yeah, he's asking my farm area if it's just the county I am or what. Um, my county is like you guys, it's pretty big. So there's a whole other world on the north side of our county. Uh, the south side of our county is the beach and Gulf Shores, Orange Beach and all that. I, I grew up in Orange Beach, Gulf Shores, went to Gulf Shores Elementary and Foley High School. So Foley, Gulf Shores, Orange Beach is kind of like the same area to us locals. And then when you get into Florida, it's pretty no key. I've got my Florida license. So I could actually, I could actually just move down here and start crushing you guys right now. <laughs> but, uh, but anyway, I, there, there's so many condos on the beach, you know, and houses right across. So and that's where my office is, and that's where I grew up right there. So I just kind of focus on the beach in terms of my farming. Now I'll sell commercial lots, apartment complexes, houses. I sell it all just from being in the business and people seeing me and coming to me and stuff. But as far as my farming prospecting efforts, I really want to be, you know. 
mid to high end Gulf front right across the street, you know, that kind of thing. I really enjoyed this, guys. <laughs> <laughs>